This is going to be the overview for 1 John. 1 John has five chapters and 105 verses. The author is the Apostle John, not John the Baptist, but the Apostle John. And John means Jehovah is gracious. Now, our three applications historically this is John's letter of assurance to the saints of his day and a warning about the spirit of Antichrist. Doctrinally, this is a letter to tribulation saints, assuring them in the truth and warning them about the Antichrist and idols. Inspirationally, this little epistle assures me and you the promise of eternal life. Now, chapter 1. In chapter 1, you're going to see fellowship with the Father. 1 John 1 11, or 1 John 1 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Jesus Christ was from the beginning. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the ending. It says, That which was from the beginning, that's the Lord. John said he heard him. John said he seen him with his, seen him with his eyes. John heard him preach. He's seen him with his own two eyes. And John lived in a time where you operated by sight. When he wrote this, he was living in a time where you are, operate by faith. And John kind of had the best of both worlds where he got to have, he had most, he had the, all the Bible wrote out before him. He had all the Old Testament, he had the Gospels, he had all of Paul's letters. So he was operating by faith in those words that were wrote down. But he was still being shown some stuff so that he could finish out the rest of the Bible. And that that's an amazing time, an amazing opportunity that he had. He was pretty much operating by faith and by sight, really. And John's hands handled the Savior. He took care of the Savior's mother. Uh, John heard the living word preach the written word. That's an amazing thing. First John 1, 2, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. You see, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Eternal life is in Him. And it, this life was manifested. It says in 1 John 1, 3, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. If you're going to fellowship with John, you had to have fellowship with God. It says in 1 John 1, 4, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. That's one reason why God wrote 1 John. He wanted to make your joy full. It says in 1 John 1, 5, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. The part of you that is in Christ can never be touched by the darkness. And 1 John 1, 6 says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. It is our flesh that walks in darkness. And when you're living for the flesh, you're neglecting the spirit and not even trying to have fellowship. So if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we're lying. You see, when you walk in the spirit, you're talking to God through prayer. He's talking to you through the Bible. But when you walk in the flesh, these things are neglected. And your flesh is just walking in darkness. And there's no real fellowship there. It says in 1 John 1, 7, But if we walk in the light as He's in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. Cleanseth us from all sin. The blood cleansed my soul permanently from sin. Once and for all, the moment I believed on Jesus Christ. But in my daily walk in this wicked flesh, the blood cleanses me from sin 
practically speaking as well. And in 1 John 1, 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Say that to your holiness, pastor. He left truth on the shelf when he claimed to be sinless. He left truth on the shelf and it's picking up dust. He could take his finger and write, read me on the truth. If he's saying that he's sinless. It says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You've already been cleansed from all sins when it comes to salvation. You were cleansed from sins past, present, and future. But, practically speaking, you need a daily confession of sins, not for salvation, not to stay saved, not to get saved, but to stay in a close walk and fellowship with God and to keep your flesh from walking in darkness. I mean, think about it. If you just go through every day and you don't acknowledge that you've sinned, you don't talk to God about how you just sinned, uh, most likely you're going to keep doing it. But if you acknowledge it, confess it, and try your best to forsake it, it's really going to cut back on it. And you're going to have good fellowship. Don't tell me that you didn't sin this week. If you think you're sinless, then His Word isn't in you. Uh, 1 John 1.10, If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His Word is not in us. Now, chapter 2, you are you are a sinner still because you got sinful flesh. But chapter 2 shows you, you got an advocate with the Father. And it's going to show you the, the enemies of the Father, the flesh world, devil, the Antichrist. 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus Christ is the advocate. The Father is the judge. The devil is the prosecutor. He's the accuser of the brethren. He likes to see the bad stuff that you do and he likes to bring it up to God and he wants permission to wreck your flesh. Just like Paul turned over people to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, the devil would like to do that to you. He'd like to ruin your flesh, your testimony, your reputation. You see, John says he's writing to you because he doesn't want you to sin, but if you do sin, you have an advocate. That is one who pleads the cause of another. And when the devil accuses you, the Lord tells the judge. But, here comes the advocate and says, it's under the blood. I've paid for that sin. First John 2, 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You see, Jesus Christ is our substitute, and he is our propitiation, that has to do with appeasing wrath. And you see in John 3.36 it says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. See, Jesus Christ took your place on the cross. And the wrath of God was poured out on him instead of on you if you're saved. And the sacrifice of Jesus Christ appeased the wrath of Almighty God. He's our propitiation. Now, if you don't get Jesus Christ's payment for sin on your soul that He paid for on the cross, if you don't get that applied to you, then you're going to face the wrath of God in hell. 1 John 2, 3, And hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. You see, many times you lose fellowship and you walk in darkness, you start to doubt your salvation. You might say, I, I don't even know if I'm saved anymore. You, you have salvation because you placed your faith. You see, you have salva salvation when you place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you can lose assurance. And you'll lose the feeling because you quit living for the Lord. You see, if you... If you you, you place your faith in the facts that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin and bar was buried and resurrected. You put your trust in that to save you. And then you're saved, and you're saved whether you feel like it or not, if you've done that. But many times, you lose fellowship and you lose the feeling. It's just na a natural thing. 
where it's set up to where you, when you lose fellowship, you lose the feeling. You lose the feeling that you have when you're living right. You feel like, you know, I am saved. Now, you shouldn't go around basing whether or not you're saved off whether you're living right. But it's just a natural thing. You start thinking you're not saved because you're not living right. And that's because you lose fellowship. And it says, And hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. You see, if you stop doing what God wants you to do, you're going to feel like, I don't even know Him. It's just like a, a friendship. You you quit fellowshipping with a friend for a while, you're going to feel like you don't even know him anymore. First John 2, 4, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. When you, love, when you live for the flesh, and you've been away from God, it's almost like you don't even know him anymore. It's like when you have been away from a parent for years that you knew your whole life. You're like, I don't even know you anymore. They could easily say that they don't even know you anymore. But God doesn't want to do that. He's not going to look at you and say, I never knew you if you've been born again. 1 John two thirteen and 14, I run into you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I run into you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I run into you little children because you have known the father. I have written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Here you have stages of spiritual growth. It talked about little children, it talked about young men, and it talks about fathers. And the wicked one is the devil. And he would like to mess up you so much that you never get to the next stage of spiritual growth. But how do you overcome the devil? It says in Revelation twelve eleven, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. It says in 1 John 2.15, No, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And it says in 2 Timothy 4.10, 4, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. You're not going to overcome him by loving the world. He's going to run you down. You see, Demas loved the present world. And... Demas loved the world and lost fellowship with Paul because of it. You see, remember what John said? You know, if you got fellowship with God, you can fe basically say, if you got fellowship with God, you can fellowship with me. Demas lost fellowship with Paul. He forsook Paul. He quit having fellowship with Paul because he started fellowshipping with the world. You see, you lose fellowship with other saints and God when you live for the world. It says in 1 John 2.16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. That is the three ways you end up sinning. The lust of the flesh, you give in to what the flesh wants. The lust of the eyes, your eyes see something they want. Then you dwell on it and let your mind wander to it. And the pride of life, you want to be the greatest. So you got the pride of life. So much that you would prove it even if it was a sin against God. If you could prove that you're the greatest, you want to do that so much that you'd sin against God, you got the pride of life going on. But it says in 1 John 2, 17, And the world passeth away. The thing that you're trying to prove so much that you're greatest at, you're trying to prove that in a world that's going to pass away. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. If it passes away then why serve it? Why serve something that passes away when you can serve something that never passes away? 1 John 2, 18, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that any Christ shall come, that any Christ shall come, even now are there many any Christs, whereby we know that it is the last time. 1 John has a lot of instructions for saints in the tribulation. And there are many antichrists today, but there is coming the antichrist. He said, that antichrist shall come. You already see them paving the way for him to step on the scene. These little antichrists are paving the way for the antichrist. And who are the antichrists today? Well, First John two twenty two through 23 says, 
Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is any Christ that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. If somebody comes to you and says that Jesus Christ isn't God, then they have rejected the clear word of God. They are an antichrist. Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh, and that is a foundational truth of your faith. And all the you see a lot of blasphemy against Jesus Christ on TV. That's the spirit of Antichrist. They don't believe Jesus Christ is God. They deny the Father and the Son by making light of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 John 2, 28, and Now, little children, abide in Him, that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. For me and you, we need to stay as close to Jesus Christ as we possibly can because the rapture could happen at any moment. For the tribulation saint, he doesn't want to be ashamed at his coming at the second advent. 1 John 2.29 If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. The holiness crowd is quick to say, See, if you're not living righteous, then you're not born again. But don't forget, you're forgetting something when you say that. It's not your flesh that's born of God. It's your soul. And that's what's sinless. Your soul is sinless. But your flesh. Another story. Your flesh still sins. But the flesh ain't born of God. So when you read this verse, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of Him. What does righteousness in you is the new creature, the new man. It's not your flesh anyway. Your flesh is not born of God, and that's what sins. So to say that you're not born of God because you've sinned, you're neglecting to make a difference between the flesh and the spirit, between the standing and the state, between the old man and the new man, the new nature and the old nature. The flesh still sins, but the new creature in you doesn't sin. It's righteous and is born of God. Chapter 3 talks about children of the Father. And it says, Now are we the sons of God. It says in 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. See, I'm going to get a body just like the Lord Jesus Christ. When he shall appear, we shall be like him. Philippians 3.21 says, Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. I'm getting a new body like his. And in 1 John 3.3 3 it says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. You see, if you have the hope of the appearing of Jesus Christ to meet you in the air, as in 1 Thessalonians 4, as that talks about, then you have a purifying hope. Because believing that Jesus could appear at any moment could keep you living pure because you want to be living right when he comes back. In 1 John 3, 4, it says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So if you overpass the rules described in the book, then you've sinned. Obviously, we aren't under the law. But to murder, to commit adultery, to lie, to steal, to covet are still a sin today. And Paul lays out a whole lot more rules than that in his epistles. There's a whole lot more rules than that in the entire Bible. And when you break the simple laws or rules laid out, you've sinned. 1 John 3, 5, And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, God was manifest in the flesh. And John chapter 1 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He manifested Himself in the flesh so that He could die on the cross and take away your sins. To do that, He had to be sinless Himself. And that's exactly what the Bible teaches in 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin. It says in Hebrews 4.15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He's sinless. And in 1 John 3.6, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. If you abide in him, then you are sinless. 
you're sinless. Now you're saying, well, how, how can I be sinless? Well, remember, your new man, your new creature, is what's in him. It's always sinless. That's the new creature. That's your soul that was that had the its sins cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And it the new that was born the moment you got saved, the moment you got born again, it doesn't sin. It is your flesh that sins. Your flesh isn't in Christ, but you can tr try your best to force your flesh to be. As sinless as it can possibly get by staying in the Word, staying in prayer, staying in the things of God, and keeping your sin in the flesh to a minimum. It says in 1 John 3, 8, He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Your flesh isn't of God. Paul calls it a body of death. He calls the flesh the old man, the wretched man. 1 John 3, 9 Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Remember, your flesh is not born of God. It's the new creature in you that's born of God. It can't sin. It's sinless. It is your flesh that sins, because it's not born of God. you got to remember that. Paul said, Paul said himself, he said, I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Your flesh isn't born of God. That's what sins. The new creature in you cannot sin because it's born of God. This verse here in 1 John 3, 9 is not saying that a truly born again person cannot sin. Meaning... That if you still sin, then you're not truly born of God, as some people want to say it. But it's like this. The new man in you, it cannot sin. It doesn't sin. It's sinless. It's righteous as Jesus Christ. It's the flesh that sins. Now, chapter 4. Chapter 4, you got assurance from the Father. 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. You know, don't just believe every Bible-toting, suit-wearing man that comes along. You need to try the spirits. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. If he corrects the Bible... That's a bad spirit. If he promotes sin, then you can see a bad spirit. If he says that Jesus Christ isn't God manifested in the flesh, then you have a very sinister antichrist spirit. For two, hereby know you the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. It is the spirit of Antichrist to deny that Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh. 1 John 4, 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Spirit in you is greater than these false prophets, than the Antichrist and the bad spirits that are roaming around this earth in the spiritual and physical realm. John writes this to give you assurance. You have assurance from the Father that greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. 1 John 4, 9, And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. God revealed His love to us by coming down in the flesh and dying on the cross for our sins. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Be assured. Chapter 4, that's your assurance from the Father. Now, chapter 5, you see the only begotten Son of the Father. His Son, Jesus Christ, the true God, eternal life. It says in 1 John 5, 4 through 5, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
You see that if you place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the payment he made to be your payment for sin, then you have overcome the world. 1 John 5, 12, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. That reminds me of John three thirty six. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Or do you believe on the only begotten Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ? If you do, then the wrath of God is off of you. First John five twenty. And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Jesus Christ is the true God. It doesn't matter what anyone says. The Bible openly and clearly says that he's God. Never let anyone get you to deny the deity of Jesus Christ. He says in 1 John 5, 21, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. If you're worshiping a false god, all you've got is a God that can neither see or hear nor walk. And you need the true God. If you're worshiping a Jesus that isn't God, because there could be another Jesus. If you're worshiping this Hollywood type Jesus that doesn't speak about sin, doesn't claim to be God, uh, is for abortion and all these other things, this the, the, the Bible talks about another Jesus, a false Jesus. You need to be worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. If someone in the tribulation worships the false Christ, the Antichrist, who's going to be a counterfeit, they have the idol shepherd. And they're going to have to keep themselves from him. So John says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. But this has been the overview of 1 John.